Chapter 25, Bleeding. Trauma applies the fundamental knowledge, like we said with the last lecture, of basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. The recognition and management of bleeding is of utmost importance. We're going to cover the pathophys, the assessment, and the manage of bleeding in your trauma and injured patient. The pathophys behind it, again, the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion to man patient management and assessment. Important is to be able to recognize bleeding, whether it's seen and clearly on the pavement and obvious, whether it's saturated clothing or whether it's a suspicion of internal bleeding. Understand how bleeding affects the body and again, how temperature of your patient and other physiological things that are going on can affect the bleeding. Bleeding can be external or internal, like I said. It can cause weakness, shock, and death. The cardiovascular system circulates blood to cells and tissues. As we've said in previous lectures, it delivers oxygen and nutrients to the cells. Cellular metabolism is established and is essential for life. It carries away metabolic waste products from the cells back out and it is excreted either through the kidneys or through the respiratory system. The cardiovascular system is responsible for, for supplying and maintaining adequate blood flow and again to maintain homeostasis within our bodies. The three parts and a review of before is the pump, which is the heart, the container, which is the blood vessels, and then the quality of the fluid, which is blood and body fluids. The heart needs a rich and well-distributed blood supply. It works as two paired pumps, which is the upper chambers, the atrium, and the lower chambers, the ventricle. Blood leaves each chamber through a one-way valve. We've got blood coming in from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, that is unoxygenated blood going to the right atrium. It is, then goes into the right ventricle and to the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery takes the unoxygenated blood, so it is the only artery within the body that carries unoxygenated blood to the pulmonary vasculature. Once that happens, it is oxygenated at the cellular level with the alveoli, then it becomes back to the heart from the pulmonary veins. So that is the only veins. There are four of them that carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. The heart returns to the left atrium. It is now oxygen rich. It goes to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle is it ejected with our cardiac output added to our aorta. Our aorta immediately bifurcates to try to get oxygen rich blood to the head and the upper body. And then it descends downward and gets oxygen-rich blood to the lower body. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arterioles are the smaller vessels that connect the arteries and capillaries, and capillaries pass among the cells and link arterioles and venules. Venules are the very small, thin-walled vessels that empty into the veins, and the veins carry the blood from the tissue back to the heart. Oxygen and nutrients pass from the capillaries into the cells and waste and carbon dioxide diffuse into the capillaries. Blood contains red blood cells, which are responsible for the transportation of oxygen to the cells and carbon dioxide away from the cells to the lungs. Blood also contains white blood cells, which are responsible for fighting infection and platelets, which are responsible for forming blood clots and a huge part of our clotting cascade and then plasma. Blood clot formation depends on a lot of things. Blood stasis, so in other words, the ability of the blood to stay in one spot, changes in the blood vessel walls, and the blood's ability to clot, which is an entire cascade of clotting factors that come directly from our liver. When tissues are injured, platelets begin to collect at the site of injury. Red blood cells start to clump together, and they become stained. The autonomic nervous system monitors the body's needs, adjusts the blood flow, and automatically redirects blood away from other organs to the heart, the brain, the lungs, and the kidneys in an emergency. It adapts to maintain homeostasis and perfusion. The pathophysiology of perfusion, which is the circulation of blood within an organ or tissue to meet the cell's needs for oxygen, nutrients, and waste removal.
You'll see this happens in the capillary beds of each tissue within each organ. The speed of blood flow has to be fast enough to maintain circulation, but slow enough to allow cells to exchange oxygen and nutrients for carbon dioxide and waste. Some tissues need a constant supply of blood, while others can survive with very little. So think about your fingertips, sensory versus your heart, your brain, your kidneys, and your liver. All organs and organ systems depend on adequate perfusion to function properly. Death of an organ system can quickly lead to the death of a patient. Emergency care supports adequate perfusion until the patient arrives at the hospital. The heart requires a constant supply of blood. The brain and spinal cord may last four to six minutes. Lungs can survive only about 15 to 20 minutes. Kidneys may survive 45 minutes. Skeletal muscles may last two hours, but the times are based on a normal body temperature. External bleeding means hemorrhage. External bleeding is visible hemorrhage and includes nosebleeds and bleeding from open wounds. Significant of external bleeding. With serious external bleeding, it may be difficult to tell the amount of blood loss. Blood looks different on different surfaces, and the estimate of the amount of external blood loss is very difficult. The body will not tolerate a blood loss of greater than 20% of blood volume. Changes in vital signs may occur with significant blood loss, which may include an increase in heart rate, increase in respiratory rate, and a decrease in blood pressure. How well people compensate for blood loss is related to how rapidly they bleed. An adult can comfortably donate one unit or 500 milliliters of blood over 15 to 20 minutes. If a similar blood loss occurs in a much shorter time, the person may rapidly develop symptoms of hypovolemic shock. Consider age and pre-existing health conditions. Characteristics of external bleeding is significant methodology of injury. The patient has a poor general appearance but is calm. Signs and symptoms of shock. You note significant blood loss. It was rapid and it is uncontrollable. Arterial bleeding. Pressure can cause blood to spurt and makes bleeding difficult to control typically brighter red and spurts in time with the pulse. Venous bleeding, however, is dark red, flows slowly or rapidly depending on the size of the vein, and does not spurt and is much easier to manage. Capillary bleeding, on the other hand, is from damaged capillary vessels. It is dark red and it continues to ooze steadily but slowly. Clotting factors. Bleeding tends to stop rather quickly within about 10 minutes. When the skin is broken, blood flows rapidly. The cut into the vessel then begins to narrow and constrict, reduces the amount of bleeding, and that is when it allows a clot to form. Bleeding will not stop if the clot does not form. Despite the efficiency of the system, it may fail in certain situations. Movement, disease, medications, removal of bandages, external environment, body temperature, and severe injury. I discussed this with you on our first lecture and have repeated it a couple of times. This is where the importance of keeping your trauma patient warm happens. They don't leave them lying on the ground. We get them into the back of the truck and get them warm, cover them with blankets as soon as we can, because a cold liver will not produce clotting factors. Hemophilia is a disease where the patient lacks the blood clotting factors. Bleeding may occur spontaneously. All injuries, no matter how trivial or potentially serious, and patients should be transported immediately. Internal bleeding in a cavity or space inside the body can occur without being seen. It can be very serious because it's not easy to detect immediately. Injury or damage to internal organs commonly results in extensive internal bleeding and can cause hypovolemic shock. Possible conditions causing external bleeding, a stomach ulcer or a GI bleed, a lacerated liver, a ruptured spleen, broken bones, especially the ribs or the femur, and a pelvic fracture. Methodology of injury for internal bleeding could be high energy, so it'll increase your index of suspicion for serious unseen injuries, but internal bleeding is possible, again, with severe forces when they have affected the body, such as blunt or penetrating trauma. Signs of injury, deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures or penetrations, burns, tenderness, 
lacerations, and swelling. Internal bleeding is not always caused by trauma. Bleeding ulcers, bleeding from a colon, uh, perhaps they've got a polyp or something else, they've got to bleed down further in the colon, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and aneurysms. Frequent signs are abdominal tenderness, guarding, in other words, they're holding their abdomen, they're not taking big deep breaths because of the way it hurts, rigidity, uh, blood within the abdomen causes it to get a board-like rigidity, pain, and distension. An act of bleed within the gut can also lead to distension because you've got blood that is forming in the abdomen. In older patients, it may include dizziness, faintness, or weakness, ulcers or other GI problems. I know I alluded to this when I met with you in class. Once you go on a GI bleed, you will know the smell. They may have vomiting of blood, but bloody diarrhea or urine are very indicative and have a very unique smell. Signs and symptoms of internal bleeding may be pain, which is your most common, swelling in the area of the bleeding, distension of the abdomen like I mentioned, dyspnea, tachycardia, and hypotension, a hematoma, and bruising. Bleeding from any body opening, hematosis, which means that it is uh, bloody vomitus, melina, which is black tarry bloody stool, pain, tenderness, bruising, guarding, or swelling, no matter where that occurs, and then broken ribs, bruises over the lower part of the chest, or a rigid, sorry, hypoperfusion may lead to changes in mental status, weakness, faintness, or dizziness on standing, changes in skin color or pallor, so extreme paleness, later signs of hypoperfusion are tachycardia, weakness, fainting, or dizziness at rest, thirst, nausea and vomiting, and cold, moist, clammy skin. Later signs of hypoperfusion include shallow, rapid breathing, dull eyes, slightly dilated pupils, capillary refill of less than two seconds in infants and children, weak, rapid, thready pulse, decreasing blood pressure, and altered level of consciousness. Scene size up. Scene safety being the most important thing as you're walking up to your patient as you're approaching the scene. Be alert to all potential hazards. At vehicle crashes, ensure the absence of leaking fuel and energize electrical lines. I mentioned battery disconnect on traumas. In violent incidents, make sure the police are on scene and follow standard precautions and protocol. Mechanism of injury and nature of illness may determine, but you need to figure out what other little scenes, in other words, what have they hit? What else are you seeing on scene that may be indicative of what's going on with your patient. Consider the need for spinal immobilization and additional resources, and consider environmental factors such as weather. Your primary assessment needs to be done, but do not be distracted from identifying life threats. Form a general impression. I mentioned a lot of you that that happens as you're walking up to your patient. Note important indicators of the patient's condition or position where they're at. Um, where it looks like they might have started, does it look like they've fallen, what have they fallen from, how high, etc. Be aware of the obvious signs of injury and determine their gender and their age. Perform a rapid exam. Your ABCs, look for life threats, treat them as you find them. If the patient has obvious life-threatening external bleeding, address it first. Assess skin color and determine level of consciousness and note it. Airway and breathing. Do we need spinal stabilization? Do they have a patent airway? Look for adequate bilateral breathing. Check for breath sounds. Provide high flow O2. Assist ventilations with a bag valve mask or a non-rebreathing mask as necessary. And insert an oropharyngeal airway if the patient is unconscious. Circulation. Assess pulse rate and quality. Determine skin condition, color, and temperature. Check cap refill time. Control any external bleeding you see, and for shock. Your transport decision. Assessment of ABCs and life threats will determine the transport priority. As you learned with trauma triage, the signs that imply rapid transport, tachycardia or tachypnea, low blood pressure, weak pulse, clammy skin. Investigate your chief complaint. Look for signs and symptoms or other injuries due to methodology or nature of illness. Again, what do you see on scene? What do you see besides where you find the patient? Take a peek around um, as far as open bottles. Even something as simple as Pepto-Bismol 
Uh, notice that there's empty bottles, and I'm saying that because uh, we recently had a salicylate overdose, and it was determined that the patient was having stomach pain and was drinking Pepto-Bismol, which is high in salicylates. So think outside the box, but if something looks odd, make a note of it. Ask a bystander if possible. Note obvious signs of internal bleeding and assess the entire patient. During your history taking, ask the patient about blood thinning medications. That includes aspirin and why I just mentioned salicylates. If the patient is unresponsive, obtain history from medical alert tags, bystanders. Again, what do you see from their med box? What do you see open containers in the bathroom, beside the bed, and beside a chair in a living room or by the kitchen sink? Look for signs and symptoms of shock and determine the amount of blood loss. Secondary assessment, record vital signs, complete a focused assessment of pain, attach appropriate monitoring devices, and with a critically injured patient or a short transport time, there may not be time to conduct a secondary assessment. That is fine. Give everything you know about the patient in your report. Assess all anatomic regions for DCAP and BTLS. Look for uncontrolled bleeding from a large scalp laceration. Feel all four quadrants of the abdomen for tenderness or rigidity. Record pulse, motor, and sensory function in extremities. I mentioned when you're boarding your patient, I want you to repeat that. When you've removed that board from the car to the gurney, I want you to repeat that. When you remove the gurney into the back of the truck, I want you to repeat that. And on handoff, record pulse, motor, and sensory function in extremities. Vital signs, assess vital signs to observe that changes may occur during treatment and during transport. A systolic blood pressure of less than 100 with a weak rapid pulse should suggest the presence of hypoperfusion and patient going into shock. Cool, moist skin that is pale or gray is an important sign. Reassessment, repeat the patient in areas that showed abnormal findings. In other words, if their pulse was getting high or low, I want you to repeat it and look at it again. Same way with blood pressure, same way with respiratory rate. Signs and symptoms of internal bleeding are often slow to present, but when they start to present, it may become faster. Reassess an unstable patient every five minutes and a stable patient every 15. Interventions. Every one of these patients should have high flow oxygen, control external bleeding, provide treatment for shock and transport rapidly, and do not delay transport of a patient to complete an assessment. Recognize, estimate, and report the amount of blood loss and how rapidly or over what period of time you think it occurred. Communicate all relevant information to the staff at the receiving hospital. Document all injuries, the care provided, and the patient response. If you get unseated, you've got a lady with uncontrolled vaginal bleeding. Make a note of how many pads she has saturated. And if you don't have time to count, then grab them, put them in a bag, and bring them with you. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous. However, that is a very good indication of how much bleeding she has actually done before you got there. Emergency medical care for external bleeding. Follow standard precautions. Wear gloves, eye protection, and possibly a mask or gown. Make sure the patient has an open airway and is breathing adequately. Provide high flow oxygen and control obvious life-threatening bleeding as quickly as possible. Several methods are available, direct even pressure and elevation, pressure dressing and or splints, and tourniquets. Direct pressure is your most effective way to control external bleeding. Pressure stops the flow of blood and permits normal coagulation to occur, like crimping off the end of that capillary or that vein or that artery. Apply pressure with your gloved fingertip or hand over the top of a sterile dressing and make it direct pressure. Hold at uninterrupted pressure for at least five minutes. Firmly wrap a sterile self-adhering roller bandage around the entire wound. Use four by four sterile gauze pads for small wounds and sterile universal dressings or ab pads for larger wounds. Cover the entire dressing above and below the wound. Stretch the bandage tight enough to control the bleeding. You should still be able to palpate a distal pulse beyond that bleeding point. Do not remove a dressing until a physician has evaluated the patient. Bleeding will almost always stop when the pressure of the dressing exceeds arterial pressure. Hemostatic agent are any chemical compound that slows or stops bleeding by assisting with clot formation. Can be used with direct pressure when direct pressure alone is ineffective. 
and the use of hemostatic agents in EMS still is largely experimental. Be aware of and follow your local protocol. Tourniquet, useful if a patient has substantial bleeding from an extremity injury. Tourniquets have gone in and out of practice over the years. However, we tend to um, follow, especially what military guidelines and what military um, personnel have as successful in treating bleeding, especially of extremities, blown off extremities, etc. and tourniquets remain in high use. Several types of commercial tourniquets are available. However, if a commercial tourniquet is unavailable, you can create a tourniquet using a triangular bandage, a stick, and a rod. When you've got that tourniquet on, do not apply a tourniquet directly over any joint, so go above that joint. Place the tourniquet proximal to the injury. So in other words, closer to the heart. Makes the tourniquet as secured, tightened, and tightened securely. Never use ro wire, rope, a belt, or any other narrow material. There may be a time you need to use a wide belt, but never use a skinny tie belt. Observe the following precautions. Place padding under the tourniquet so it does not cut into the skin. Never cover a tourniquet with a bandage because you want to be able to see at all times exactly what is going on. And do not loosen the tourniquet after you have applied it. Air splints. Soft splints or pressure splints that can be applied over an injury. Um, a fracture can control internal or external bleeding associated with severe injury. Air splints immobilize the fracture. Act like a pressure dressing, but you need to use only approved, clean, or disposable valve stems. Rigid splints will help immobilize fractures. They reduce the pain. They decrease the friction of the bone ends. They also um, immobilize, like I said, and try to secure it during transport. So it prevents further damage to the soft tissues. Once the splint is applied, monitor circulation in the distal extremity. Bleeding from the nose, ears, and mouth. Several conditions can cause this, skull fracture, facial injuries, sinusitis or inflammation of the sinuses, infection, use and abuse of nose drops, dried or cracked nasal mucosa, high blood pressure, coagulation disorders, and digital trauma. Yes, by use of the finger up the nose, particularly with kids. Epistasis is a nosebleed. It's a common emergency. Occasionally, it can cause enough blood loss to send a patient into shock can usually be controlled by pinching the nostrils together. Bleeding from the nose or ears following a head injury may indicate a skull fracture, may be very difficult to control. Do not attempt to stop the blood flow if you think that's what it's from because, again, you do not want to cause a increased intracranial pressure situation. Loosely cover the bleeding site with a sterile gauze pad and apply light compression with a dressing. That's from the nose or the ears. A target or halo-shaped stain may occur on the dressing if blood or damage um, the drainage contains cerebral spinal fluid. So you'll notice you've got the center, which is red and obviously blood, and then you have a yellow halo around that blood. That is the color of cerebral spinal fluid. Again, emergency care for internal bleeding usually requires surgery or other hospital procedures. Keep the patient as calm as possible. Reassure them as still as quiet as possible. Provide high-flow oxygen. Maintain their body temperature and splint an injured extremity with an air splint. In review, which of the following is not a component of the cardiovascular system? The heart, the lungs, the venules, or the plasma? B. The components of the cardiovascular system include the heart, the blood vessels, which are the arteries, the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, and the veins, and the blood, which is the plasma, and the blood cells. The lungs are a component of the respiratory system. So again, heart is cardiovascular, lungs are not. Venules are part of it, as is plasma. Perfusion is most accurately defined as the remo removal of adequate amounts of carbon dioxide during exhalation, the intake of adequate amount of oxygen during the inhalation phase, circulation of blood within an organ with sufficient amounts of oxygen, and the production of carbon dioxide, which accumulates at the cellular level. So perfusion is the circulation of blood within an organ and tissues with sufficient amount of oxygen and other nutrients. Carbon dioxide is the byproduct of normal cellular metabolism. It should be returned to the lungs for removal from the body. It should not accumulate at the cellular level. Perfusion again, removal 
of carbon dioxide is a part of exhalation, not perfusion. Intake of adequate amount of oxygen during inhalation is ventilation, not perfusion. Circulation of blood within an organ with a sufficient amount of oxygen is the correct answer. And carbon dioxide is a normal byproduct of cellular metabolism and should not accumulate in cells. A man involved in a motorcycle crash has multiple abrasions and lacerations. Which of the following injuries has the highest treatment priority? His widespread abrasions to his back with pinkish ooze, a three-inch laceration to the forehead with dark red flowing blood, a laceration to the forearm with obvious debris in the wound, or a one-inch laceration to the thigh with spurting bright red blood? The answer is going to be D. That would indicate bleeding from an artery which produces bright red bleeding that spurts with the pulse. The pressure that causes the blood to spurt also makes this type of bleeding difficult to control. Direct pressure with extreme force with your fingertips over a sterile dressing. It doesn't even need to be taped down. You just need a 4x4 underneath your gloved hand, and you're going to press down to stop that bleeding. Blood loss from an arterial wound is more severe and thus more life-threatening than from a venous wound and requires surgical recovery. So again, widespread abrasions. They're painful, but not an immediate life threat. Venous bleeding is controlled after arterial bleeding controlled. The laceration to the forearm is no indication that this wound is active bleeding and that thigh laceration that is spurting needs highest treatment. Which of the following sets of vital signs is least indicative of internal bleeding? BP 140 over 90, pulse rate 58, respirs 8. BP 100 over 50, pulse rate 120, respirs 24. BP 98 over 60, pulse rate 160, respirs 28. BP 102 over 48, pulse rate 100, respirs 22. So least indicative. Which one is the most staple patient? A. Internal hemorrhage typically reveals vital signs that are consistent with shock, hypotension, tachycardia, and tachypnea. Hypertension, bradycardia, and bradyipnea so that would be a slow respiratory rate, is consistent with a closed head injury, not internal bleeding. Again, A is the correct answer. B is indicative of progression to decompensated shock. C is indicative of progression to decompensated shock. And D is indicative of progression to decompensated shock. When caring for a patient with internal bleeding, the EMT must first ensure a patent airway, obtain baseline vital signs, control any external bleeding, and take appropriate standard precautions. D. All of the interventions in this question must be performed. However, before providing patient care, whether the patient is bleeding or not, the EMT must first ensure that he or she has taken the appropriate standard precautions. So A would be the first step after standard precautions. B would be the third step after standard precautions, airway and bleeding control. C would be the second step after standard precautions and airway. And D would be your correct. Number six, the quickest and most effective way to control external bleeding from an extremity is A, a pressure bandage, B, direct pressure and elevation, C, a splint, D, a tourniquet. B, direct pressure is always going to be the quickest, most effective way to control external bleeding from an extremity. This will effectively control external bleeding in most cases. So A is done after direct pressure has controlled the bleeding, then we'll put a pressure dressing on. Direct pressure and elevation is good. A splint, most cases of external bleeding can be controlled by direct pressure and elevation and do not require a splint. And D is the last method of controlling external bleeding. When applying a tourniquet to an amputated arm, the EMT should A. Use the narrowest bandage possible. B. Avoid applying the tourniquet over a joint. C. Cover the tourniquet with a sterile bandage. And D. Use rope to ensure that the tourniquet is tight. If you must apply a tourniquet, never apply it directly over a joint. You should use the widest bandage possible and make sure it is secured tightly. Never use wire, rope, a belt, or any other narrow material as it could cut the skin. The tourniquet should be 
never be covered with a bandage. You want to be able to assess it at all time, leave it open, and in full view. Again, use widest bandage possible. Apply it not over a joint, excuse me, avoid applying a joint. Never cover it. You need to be able to see it and do not use anything that may be uh, very narrow and cut or damage the extremity. A 70-year-old man is experiencing a severe nosebleed. When you arrive, you find him leaning over a basin, which contains an impressive amount of blood. He has a history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, and migraine headaches. His BP is 180 over 100, and his heart rate is 100. Which of the following is most likely contributing factor to his nosebleed? A, his blood pressure. B, his history of diabetes. C, the fact that he is elderly or D, the heart rate of 100 beats a minute? A, several conditions can cause nosebleed or epistaxis, including skull fractures, facial injuries, sinusitis, high blood pressure, coagulation disorders, and digital trauma, nose picking. A BP of 180 over 100 indicates a significant amount of pressure on the arteries, which is no doubt the main contributing factor to this patient's nosebleed. His history of diabetes can cause hypertension and vascular problems, but usually doesn't cause a nosebleed. The fact that he's elderly, they are prone to hypertension, which can cause nosebleeds, but age is not a factor necessarily. And his heart rate of 100 may be the result of his age or a compensatory mechanism dealing with blood loss. When caring for a patient with severe epistasis, the most effective way to prevent aspiration of blood is to a, insert a nasopharyngeal airway and lean the patient back. B, tilt the patient's head forward while he or she is leaning forward. C, place the patient supine with his or her head in the flex position. And D, tilt the head, patient's head forward while he or she is leaning backward. B, leaning forward with the head tilted forward will stop bleeding from trickling down the throat. This decreases the risk that the patient will swallow the blood, which may cause vomiting or aspirating the blood into the lungs. You would never insert a nasopharyngeal airway into an actively bleeding nare. Yes, you're going to lean them forward and tilt their head forward. You would never lie them on their back. It'll cause the blood to be swallowed, may cause vomiting. And you would tilt the patient's head forward, but the patient's body must also be leaning forward. Controlling and turning bleeding requires A, applying a tourniquet, B, surgery in a hospital, C, positioning the patient in the sitting position, and D, providing slow and considerate transport. B, controlling internal bleeding usually requires surgery that must be done in the hospital. To care for the patient in the field, administer high flow O2, assist ventilations if needed, control all obvious external bleeding, monitor and record the vital signs every five minutes, place the non-trauma patient in a shock position, and keep the patient warm and provide immediate transport. You would never be using a tourniquet to control bleeding from a closed internal soft tissue injury. Positioning the patient should be in a supine position in the first place, never in a sitting position, and slow and considerate transport, not hardly, you provide immediate transport. 